Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 18, Time to Settle Down, The Domestic Economy of Hazaria. Before we begin, I'm sure that most of you will have noted that the podcast now has a Patreon, and so I have my first patrons to thank. Eternal thanks go to State Councillor Sabina, my boyars John, Q and Goran, Princess Anna and Grand Prince Thomas for their kind support. They are now enjoying their exclusive member episode on the Huns, which any of you can also receive by signing up for a subscription on Anchor, if you are a Spotify user, then the member episodes will automatically appear in your feed, or by joining the Patreon and using the exclusive RSS feed. If this show ever gets ads, members will also enjoy it ad-free. See the show notes for links. So as I've noted in passing a few times, the secret of the Khazar's success was the combination of steppe military power with a thriving economy. And in this episode, we're going to take a closer look at the domestic economy and what the Kayanath produced. Agricultural development, both in terms of the Khazars themselves and others of their subject, steppe peoples, adopting a settled lifestyle, and in terms of the Slavic and Finno-Ugrian peoples they ruled over, was a key difference between the Khazars and preceding steppe empires. Pastoralism remained very important alongside agriculture. Some steppe peoples never quite settled down and maintained a nomadic or semi-nomadic lifestyle with winter quarters and summer in the pastures. The Khazars were particularly noted for exports of sheep and wool, but they also extensively raised cattle for meat and dairy, and of course horses for military purposes. As previously noted, the southernmost part of the Volga is decidedly arid, with very little rainfall. What water there is comes from the river system, bringing it down from the wetter north. So, although Arab and other visitors described large areas under cultivation around the capital, Itil, somewhere in the Volga Delta, the main agricultural regions were outside of the Khazar heartland, on the edge of the steppe and in the forest steppe belt. The forest steppe belt is mostly low, gently rolling hills. It's crisscrossed by valleys and ravines, some are older, carved out by the glaciers of the retreating ice age. Some are still being formed by rivers and streams today. Watershed areas, in particular, have a large number of river ravines and are more thickly forested. The relief can generally be divided into three categories. There are watershed plateaus in the higher parts gently sloping hills with a slight southerly inclination dissected by river ravines, and some low floodplains along the major rivers. Erosion has been the main force shaping the landscape. As the ice retreated, deciduous forest followed, falling into decay as the temperate zone moved north and the forest became steppe, and combining with steppe vegetation to form the famous Black Earth around 5,000 years ago. In more northerly parts of the forest steppe, the greater numbers of conifers have created a more acidic soil that is less productive for agriculture. The Khazars found themselves at the tail end of a period running from approximately 1200 BCE to 1000 CE, in which dark forest with extensive larch and spruce growth, was expanding west of the Urals. Besides extending into the forest steppe belt, this change affected the more southerly parts of the plain by increasing the amount of water flowing south. The dark forest was cooler than the deciduous forest, as its name suggests, 
It blocked the sunlight, and so it reduced water loss to evaporation and retained more rainfall and snowmelt in the ground. From there, this groundwater would flow into the rivers and be taken south. This was naturally conducive to an expansion of agriculture, but it came to an end in the latter period of the Cathar Kagana, with a climate shift to reduced precipitation, and both Khazar and Rus records show them struggling with frequent droughts in the 10th and 11th centuries. Another factor in play before modern river management was the seasonal variation in river flows. With most precipitation falling as snow in winter, rivers would fill with the spring thaw, but then fall to a low level by mid to late summer, sometimes even dry out. Further north, for instance, the Moscow River was only seasonally navigable until Soviet-era works to maintain water levels, with a rather pitiful trickle flowing past the Kremlin by late August. In much of the steppe and forest steppe zone, tributary rivers would regularly dry out, and even major rivers could be reduced to streams. As a result of this, the spring flood could cause the course of the river to shift somewhere else across the plain. A settlement built on a river bank could find itself a few years later, kilometres away from the watercourse. But generally, the forest steppe and the area that is now east and southeast Ukraine had sufficient water during this period to support extensive agriculture without the need for artificial irrigation. Archaeological finds even suggest that cereal cultivation increased during the shift to a drier climate, as there was a reduction in the quantity of waterlogged land. In the forest steppe, a little more than half the land was forested, with maple, linden and oak filling the river valleys. Some scholars believe that the deeper, steeper and therefore more sheltered valleys could have maintained forest all the way down to the Black Sea, although the forest limits today are much further north, a transition that likely occurred during the medieval warm period. Between the forests lay open meadow that could easily be put under the plough and marshy areas that were used for animal grazing. Reducing the undergrowth in the forest and tree cutting to create clearings enabled grass to grow there too which was also used for grazing. So putting all that together, we have naturally fertile soils in easily accessible meadows, plentiful water, deciduous forests providing wood, nuts and grazing, a readily traversable relief of low rolling hills and a fairly moderate climate. Ideal conditions for the development of agriculture. But what did these early farmers grow, and who were they? As with previous discussions, archaeologists postulate a number of cultures in the region, typically named after the village where the first artefacts were discovered. And I don't want to overburden you with difficult to pronounce and remember names, so I'll try to simplify the nomenclature a bit. First, we have the Saltova Mayaki culture. Now, that is a Soviet-era name, and it's probably still the most widely used, often shortened to Saltova. But in more recent works, you might also see it as Saltiv. If you've been following the news, you might have cottoned on that that of-iv variation is one of the differences between Russian and Ukrainian, and that is the case here. The first part of the name comes from a site excavated at Verkhny Saltiv, a village in Kharkiv region, Ukraine while the second part comes from Mayaki Gorodishu, excavated at the confluence of the Tikhaya Sosna and Don rivers in Voronezh region, Russia. As my main source for this part of the episode is a book called Agriculture in the Forest Steppe Region of Khazaria by the Ukrainian historians Volodymyr Kolodar and Serhii Khorbenenko, I'm going to go with Saltiv. But keep in mind that we are talking about a culture that spread across both Russia and Ukraine. 
The Saltiv culture represents Khazars and other steppe nomads in their confederation, including Alans and Bulgars, as they transitioned into a sedentary agricultural lifestyle. The Khazars ruled over Slavs settled in the forest steppe, from the Don through to the area around Kiev, who were later referred to in early Rus texts as Poliani, Severa, Viatici, and Radimici. Archaeologists use a range of names for localized cultures, but I will just call them Slavs, as it will be hard for you to place them on a map while you are listening. In these western areas, Saltiv and Slavic sites could be neighbors. There was clearly a fair degree of intermingling, and lots of Saltiv items are found at Slavic sites and vice versa, but they do have discernible differences. Both Slavs and nomad settlers lived in similar extended family homesteads around hill forts, with the settled area extending up to a couple of kilometers from the stronghold. Archaeologists investigating these sites find several different kinds of artifact that help reveal what the agriculture was like. There are elements of the settlement related to grain production, like silos, storage pits and millstones, or to animal husbandry, such as stables and byres. Archaeologists can track waste products, such as manure, and find traces of crop rotation. Animal remains provide information on whether they were raised for meat or dairy and wool. And then there are different kinds of tools, shears and bells for animals, scythes and plows for farming. The location of the sites also has an effect on usage. Areas with soils formed by the forest have more acidic soils and tended to be used for swidden or slash and burn cultivation. The Black Earth Zone was more suited to arable crop rotation. Floodplain areas would have their nutrients replenished by the annual inundation, so rotation there was not necessary. In floodplain areas, the soil was easier to break, so a wooden plough without an iron blade could be used. In Swidden areas, a narrow ploughshare was used. Where there are broad ploughshares with coulters, that is the name of the vertical blade running ahead of the ploughshare to cut the ground before it is turned, they indicate a higher level of technological development in the village, which in turn makes a wider range of crops available to them for cultivation. These early farmers also used hoes, and the saltive communities used spades to dig pits and cultivate smaller garden-like plantations. The use of iron reinforcement on the spades and the type of socket used to attach the head to the shaft of the hoe are also a good indicator of the level of technological development. The location and tools combine with traces of grains found to tell us about what and how the community was farming. So we have Prosso millet, of course, which we have already heard that steppe nomads may have grown occasionally even when fully mobile. The prevalence of millet is associated with a lower level of technology, slash and burn cultivation, and floodplains. It is often found alongside the equally tough barley and emma wheat. Weeding is highly beneficial, but it does not require deep ploughing and can be scattered directly onto the ground after it's burnt off. Millet cultivation was particularly suitable for the semi nomadic population who could sporadically cultivate fields that were at some distance from each other without having to carry significant tools with them, which was probably a major consideration for the saltive, given the other indicators of their relatively high technological level. Communities that grew a large amount of barley may also have been at a lower technological level, as it is also well suited to Sweden farming or they could have been practicing a higher degree of animal husbandry, as barley was used for animal feed and the straw is almost as nutritious as hay. Barley is climate and drought resistant, is less demanding of soil fertility, and grows fast, ripening for harvest in as little as 60 days in good conditions. So in these southerly reaches, that means up to three harvests a year could be raised. 
Emma Wheat was one of the first cereals cultivated and was introduced to the steppe alongside barley. It is well suited to the climate. When found with millet and barley, it is indicative of low technology farming. Wheat and rye are the high-tech crops of the early medieval period. They require more soil treatment. Deep ploughing is essential, so better shaped iron-tipped ploughs and rotation. But they are much more productive. That productivity means a surplus, and the surplus supports population growth. So their cultivation from the 8th century was key to the development of both Rus and Khazaria. Rye was also an important animal feed. Oats are found only rarely, most likely for animal consumption, and we still don't have the modern era's favourite grain, buckwheat. Archaeologists also look out for weeds, which can also provide us with information. First, weeds indicate long-term farming. Freshly burned Swidden fields do not have weeds. Brome, a kind of grass, grows where winter rye is planted and is an indicator of the use of two- or three-field rotation. Ibrahim ibn Yaqub, a Sephardi merchant from Moorish Cordoba, who wrote about his travels to the east, notes that the Slavs sowed in both spring and summer and reaped two harvests. As the Saltif appeared to have been more advanced, they probably did the same. The grain was stored in large silos and barns for the long term, as well as in smaller pits inside houses, and containers such as earthenware jars and leather and linen bags. The silos were dug around two metres deep and had stepped walls. So, what we see over the duration of the Kazakh Kayan is a gradual transition from primitive agriculture with low input grain scattered on floodplains and burned land to a high level of farming with high productivity but sensitive crops that require care and skill cultivated using complex tools which also indicate a certain level of manufacturing sophistication. This development resulted in harvests sufficient for creating a buffer against annual variations, fostering trade and supporting growth in population. We already know that steppe nomads were highly successful herdsmen, so you'd be right to assume that they continue their animal husbandry as they become more settled. Slav communities also kept animals, but we can detect some differences. For both Saltiv and Slav settlements, cattle account for around a third, very rarely less than a quarter, and never more than half, of the bones found. But there is a bit of variation within that. The age of the animal indicates how important cattle were in the village where it was slaughtered. Older animals indicate that cattle herding was well established. The animals were used long term before being killed for meat. The bones of younger animals show that the cattle were acquired for meat rather than for some other purpose. There is a big difference in small livestock. In saltive settlements, sheep and goats are the majority remains in terms of individual bone numbers, as high as two-thirds, and often found with the remains of other animals from the open steppe, such as saiga, corsac fox, marmots and hares. Sheep outnumber the goats. In Slav settlements, only 15 to 20 percent of remains are small livestock. The most common small livestock artifacts found are bells hung on the animals when they were taken out to pasture, or shears for wool production. As you might expect, it's a similar story with horses, with saltive sites providing around twice as many bones as Slav ones. Most horses died in old age, and foals are very rarely found. Saltive burial sites also continue the steppe tradition of horse-related grave goods, with bits, bridles, stirrups, and other gear buried alongside males and their weapons. Saltive horse gear is very standardised, making it an important identifier of their settlements. It's not clear whether horses were used to pull ploughs, but it is entirely possible. Pigs are inconsistent. 
I've already mentioned that pigs were generally not cultivated on the steppe, where the environment and the pastoralist lifestyle does not suit them. So we find more pigs at Slav sites than at Saltiv. At most sites, we also find that most pigs were slaughtered young for meat, as would be expected. But there are some sites where only old pigs are found. There is also a significant minority of sites where no pigs are found. On the present evidence, it's impossible to tell if this was due to local religious beliefs or some other kind of preference. Can you guess which other domesticated animal we find? I'd be interested to know if any of you get this, but it is actually the camel, not something that modern Ukraine is known for. Camels are only found at saltive sites, and presumably arrived through the Khazar's Asian trade routes. Overall, sheep and goats were kept for wool and dairy production. Cattle was the most important source of meat, followed by horse in saltive settlements, and then pork. Saltiv and Slav settlements used different methods of animal husbandry. Slav settlements were stall and pasture, which means that the animals were kept in stalls, either specialised buildings for that purpose or pens within the settlement, and led out to pasture within a limited area. This method was essentially for raising animals alongside soil cultivation. The animals would be grazed on fields lying fallow in a rotational system, or on the edge of forests or marshy areas of floodplains that were not suitable for planting. There are archaeological remains for the creation of fenced paddocks in Slav settlements from the early 10th century. As well as a place for keeping the animals at night, the stalls naturally also provided winter shelter and some of the discovered animal buildings were even equipped with fireplaces. Saltive settlements, on the other hand, practiced transhumans, with the animals taken to pastures that might be a considerable distance away from the settlement to graze for a whole season. As well as horses for the shepherds to ride, saltive settlements contained significantly more remains of dogs which would have been used for protection from wolves and other predators, as well as herding. One thing that may be surprising is the relative lack of indications of hunting in all settlements, both Saltiv and Slavic. Despite the cultural importance of hunting to steppe nomads, little beyond an occasional wild boar bone is found in the villages. What remains of non-domesticated animals there are are more indicative of fur trapping, that is, they're more likely related to trade rather than food production, although of course the animals trapped for fur could also have been eaten. Slavic villages have more of these hunting remains, while saltive elements have more remains of domesticated livestock, and a mix of grain production that includes more feed grown to support their herds. They would have consumed more meat than the Slavs, and enough of their wool production went to trade for Khazaria to have a reputation for wool exports in Byzantium and the Caliphate. So the overall picture for the west of the Khazar Khayanat is of well-developed and successful agriculture and animal husbandry that produced a broad range of grain, meat, dairy and wool products. Output was sufficient to support a growing population, which would eventually lay the groundwork for the Rus to rival the Khazars, and hundreds of settlements have been discovered. A surplus for trade was produced, including exports out of the Khayanath. Standardised tools indicate manufacturing by specialised craftspeople, with farmers having the resources to purchase high-quality implements rather than being forced to rely on their own ability to make them. But while we may have expected the Black Earth region, future breadbasket of Europe, to start showing signs of its agricultural future, the rest of the Kayanas also had a thriving domestic economy. Although foreign contemporaries were quick to note the Khazar's role as trade intermediaries, with Arab writer Istakhri commenting that, quote, 
The Khazar country produces nothing which can be exported to other lands except Isinglass. As to the slaves, honey, wax, beaver, and other skins, they are imported to Khazaria. End quote. This illustrates the pitfalls of treating the Khazars separately rather than including all the peoples they ruled in the Kayanat, and creates a misleading impression as all of the things mentioned were produced by the tributary peoples within the Kayanat as well as coming from outside. It is also hardly accurate. The Hudud al Alam, a 10th century Persian geography of the world, notes Khazar sheep exports, and al Masudi, an Arab historian and geographer, discusses the work of Muslim artisans resident in Italy. As noted in the previous episode, it is not entirely clear how many peoples the Khazars ruled. The Arab traveller to the Bulgars we have already encountered, Ibn Fadlan, says 25. Jewish philologist and traveller El Dad Habani says 28. And in a letter, the Kayan Joseph says he collects tribute from numerous peoples and lists at least 38. Obviously, there could be differences in defining peoples and differences of opinion over who was a tributary. But it is fair to say that the Khazars ruled 20 to 40 other peoples, both steppe and sedentary, so these peoples should also be included in the economy of Khazaria. It was this variety with regional products, agriculture and pastoralism, foraging elsewhere in the forest belt, that made the Khazars stronger and more durable than their predecessors. The Khazars were essentially self-sufficient in all essentials, if they needed to be. So, although the Khazars are sometimes pictured as just sitting there in the North Caspian, controlling the Silk Road and Volga trade, you should not think of this as a static kind of situation. Flows and volumes were in constant flux as the world around them changed. While they ruled, the Islamic world underwent enormous changes. The Vikings broke out of Scandinavia, leaving their very significant mark from Iceland to the Mediterranean and very much in the lands of the Rus. Volga Bulgaria grew into a serious competitor. Historians have been able to track some of the transformations in Khazar trade by analysing hordes of dirhams, the coins used in the Islamic world, carried back into northern and western Europe through Khazar lands. Thousands of these hordes have been found, and they show that sometime around 900, there was a major shift that could well be the start of the process that would culminate in the fall of Khazaria in 965. We'll be looking at this in detail in the next episode. But first, let's continue our look at the diversified domestic economy, which combined with the highly lucrative foreign trade to put the Khazars in an enviable position for any state. The tribute from subject peoples and the taxes on trade maintained an effective central apparatus, including the Muslim mercenary standing army from Khwarizm. The standing army both enforced the Khayyam's rule over his vassal peoples, and provided peace and security for commerce to flourish. The Khazar capital, Itil, was somewhere in the Volga Delta, and according to contemporary reports, it was divided into two parts. The western side, Khazaran, was the home of the Khayan, his entourage, and the Khazar aristocracy. The eastern part, called Itil, was the home of the merchants, craftsmen, and foreign travellers doing business with them. The city was decidedly diverse, with Jews, Christians and Muslims, and a large number of slaves from all over the place. The two parts thus reflected the city's dual role as the royal capital and as the nexus of the trade routes. As the site of the city is lost, it's hard to estimate its size. Khan Joseph's letter says that Khazaran was three by three farsaks, an old Arab measure equal to around 5 kilometers, while Itil was 8 by 8. The Kayan's Muslim mercenaries, some sources say 4,000, others 10,000, lived in the city. Arab writers say that there were 10,000 Muslim merchants and craftsmen, 
who were only a fraction of the total population. Writers report that the city had several mosques and religious schools. Whatever the case, it seems clear that this was a large city by the standards of the day, by the standards of the day with tens of thousands of residents. According to Joseph, the city was surrounded by the Cairns fields, vineyards and gardens, which extended in a belt 20 farsakhs deep around the city. The city housed customs, which collected a tenth from all the goods shipped along the Volga, and a commercial court to adjudicate disputes among merchants. The court had seven judges, two for Muslim complainants, two for Jewish Khazars, two for Christians, and one for the pagans. Ibn Fadlan writes that the Muslim judges had sole jurisdiction over Muslim residents. The central administration also collected the tributes and tithes from the rest of the Kayanath. No detailed description of this tribute has been found, but the peoples of the forest step zone seem to have paid theirs in furs. The Volga Bulgars paid one sable skin per household per year, a fur very highly valued in the Middle East. The Slavs on the Dnieper paid one squirrel skin per household. As the more advanced, more productive agriculture we started the episode with developed, the farmers began to pay a tax of one dirham per plowshare. That is, where economic development generated a surplus that could be traded and monetized, the tribute was also monetized. Although records are scant, in all likelihood the other peoples also paid tribute in their main produce, so the nomadic Pechenegs, say, could have provided sheep, cattle, or horses. Istakri notes that the tax system was highly organized and carried out regular reassessments of regional produce to determine the amount payable. On the trade routes, the Khazars collected a tenth of the value of the goods, on all goods, on all routes, land, river or sea, no exceptions. The ubiquitous tax became accepted as the norm and was adopted by the Rus and the Bulgars. For a while, this meant that a merchant arriving in Itil, before travelling on to Bulga, would pay a tenth of his goods as a levy in Itil, and then a tenth again in Bulga. But besides these taxes on the household or land holding and commercial goods, there was no personal wealth tax. For the Khazars, the capital was their winter home. Many of the foreign writers who visited comment that they would leave in the summer, either going to their estates in the extensive cultivated belt around the city, or out into the steppe. The evidence suggests that the estates were owned by clans or families, and were inherited across generations, rather than belonging to the Kayan. Unlike the grain-focused agriculture in the Dnieper Donets forest steppe belt, the cultivated land around Itil was watered with an extensive irrigation system and included substantial fruit orchards. Arab writers note that the fruit and other fresh produce was delivered to the city by water. The water of the Volga, the enormous delta and the Caspian Sea also provided the city's main source of protein, fish, which travellers noted was a staple food for the Khazars. Fish was also used to produce isinglass, a form of collagen obtained from the swim bladder of fish. Its main use is to clarify beer and alcohol. When added at the end of fermentation, it causes the yeast to clump together and sink to the bottom of the fermenter, a process that unaided may take considerable time. Until the 19th century, isinglass could only be made from sturgeon, preferably beluga, a native fish of the Black Sea Basin. The name actually comes from the Dutch word for sturgeon bladder. This gave Khazaria, and later Russia, a valuable monopoly over the product for centuries. Scottish inventor William Murdoch developed a way to make isinglass from cod in 1795, and modern isinglass is made from a variety of fish. Contrary to Stackery's opinion that the honey and wax the Khazars exported was brought from elsewhere, the Volga region under their control is a major honey-producing region today, so there is no reason to think that it would not have been then. 
Arab customers particularly value the high-quality wax. The combination of well-developed agriculture and fisheries with the departure of the Cayenne and the Khazar aristocracy for summer in the steppe. Arab writers unanimously report the Cayenne taking thousands of riders out of the city each spring has been described as ritual nomadism. The general population had essentially become sedentary, while the upper class continued to practice a limited nomadism that most likely had the practical purpose of maintaining the horse herds and military training but also the symbolic value of maintaining the Koyan's image and tradition. This became typical in the Western steppe. While in the East, true nomadism continued for centuries, in Hungary, Khazaria, and later in the Golden Horde, it was reduced to this ritualistic annual display. West of Itil, the steppe from the Volga to the Slav lands on the Dnieper, was the main pastoral region. Here, the Pechenegs, a semi-nomadic Turkic people, raised their herds and sold cattle, horses and sheep to the capital. The extent of their submission to the Khazars is in some doubt. Although Khan Joseph refers to them as his tributaries, the Byzantine records describe them as independent tribes which the emperor regularly hired to fight the Hungarians, Rus, and other enemies. Arab writers described the Khazars raiding the Pechenegs for slaves each summer. The Pechenegs in turn raided further west, mainly into Slavic territory, for more slaves that they sold in Itil to traders from the south. South of Itil, the Crimean Peninsula was an interface for Khazar interaction with Byzantium. Precise records are scant but it appears that the Khazars established full control over the peninsula, including the cities that had been integrated into the Byzantine Empire, but the empire later recovered control over Kherson and the other towns. The peninsula can be split into two zones. The Kerch Peninsula and the southern coast are watered by rivers and had a well-established sedentary agricultural population that had been in place since the time of the Greek colonies. The uplands north and west, in contrast, is a dry steppe. This steppe area was used as a seasonal pasture by the nomadic Bulgars, but after the Khazars subdued the Bulgars, they became stuck there year-round. This forced the Bulgars to sedentarize. Many settled in the southern towns, which were under Khazar control at the time, while others formed saltive culture settlements in the steppe and developed a successful agrarian economy. The main crop in Crimea was wheat, which, as we have already mentioned, is an indicator of a higher level of farming technology. Archaeologists have calculated that a village of 25 families would be sufficiently productive to generate a surplus of 85 tonnes a year. Up to half of this could be taken in taxes and tribute, but that still left a significant amount for trade into the cities. Numerous workshops and mills have been found, showing that there was also a high level of craft output and grain processing. Crimea had been a wine-producing region since the Greek settlement, and this continued under the Khazars. Saltive sites with terraced vineyards have been found, with post holes for the vine supports numbering up to 10,000 showing the production must have been quite significant. Although animal husbandry naturally shrank as the Bulgars settled and turned to agriculture, at the beginning of the 8th century, Crimea was exporting 300 tonnes of meat a year to Byzantium, and triple that by the end of the century. The saltive settlements of the peninsula also formed a centre of wool production, with numerous finds of spinning and weaving tools, as well as wool and cloth. This was a move up from the steppe, where felting was more common. You will recall the incredible jewellery that the Bosporan cities made for their Scythian clients, and Crimea remained a centre for this industry. The local craftsmen were well versed in casting, stamping, engraving, gilding and filigree work, and supplied their luxury goods to the inland and Byzantine markets. 
Other manufacturing in Crimea was also important. The peninsula has extensive remains of metallurgical production, both agricultural implements and weapons, and was the Kayanat's main centre for ceramics production. Unlike the handmade ceramics of the forest steppe zone, Crimean pottery was heavily influenced by Byzantine methods and designs, producing huge amounts of wheel-thrown amphorae, fired in larger kilns with multiple internal levels. From the nomadic economy at the beginning of the Khazar period, through sedentarization and the development of agriculture, Crimea developed a thriving and prosperous economy, with significant exports to Byzantium and imports of luxury goods. North of the Khazars, but south of the Bulgars, were the Burtas, a sedentary Turkic group who lived in felt tents, had a primarily pastoralist economy. Living on the edge of the forest zone, the Burtas also trapped for furs, especially black and red foxes, which became known as Burtasi. These pelts were the most valued in the Islamic world, where a black Burtasi hat was the ultimate status symbol, outranking mere sable. A single pelt was worth at least a hundred dinars. There was a strong trade in merchants from Ittil, travelling up the Volga to buy furs from the Burtas to sell on to the Arabs, with each pelt bringing a tidy sum in customs duty for the Kagan in Ittil. The Burtas also had well-developed agriculture, though it is particularly noted that they did not grow fruit, and they supplied the capital with grain, vegetables and honey, as well as livestock. So the big picture is that, with the exception of the steppe in the east of the Kaganat, which was reserved for their ritual nomadism, there was a thriving economy throughout the region. Output sustained a stable central administration and standing army, and produced sufficient surplus for significant exports. Villages were productive enough to move beyond subsistence and barter to the use of money and steadily growing populations. Join me next time as we look at the Khazars and international trade, relations with Byzantium and other neighbours. Each episode has an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss and sources. You can find them through the link in the show notes or on the website at www.therussianempirehistorypodcast.com You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter or Facebook or email to hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>